Hi, and welcome to CASA Presents Your Mental Health. I'm Leslie McDonald. Well, 2020 has now come and gone, and a new year represents new hope. But this pandemic is far from over, and we've become keenly aware that we're also living through a mental health pandemic, and we're all impacted in ways big and small. And that's where this webcast series is designed to help. It's brought to you by CASA Child, Adolescent and Family Mental Health, a respected nonprofit organization that's been around for more than 30 years in Alberta, providing assessments and treatment services for infants, children and their families. Well, for nearly four years now, we've shared their vast network of expertise and resources through the Dr. Roger Bland Lecture Series. We bring that discussion now online, giving you reliable, accurate information to inspire conversation, hope, and wisdom. We have significant partners who bring support and expertise to the series as well. We want to thank Alberta Health for making this series possible, and to our ongoing partners, Edmonton Public Schools, the Institute of Health Economics, and the University of Alberta Department of Psychiatry. We also want to acknowledge Global Edmonton for their partnership in this monthly series. Well, our topic for this webcast is loss and grief in a pandemic. And with all the changes we've experienced over this past year, we've all experienced some form of loss. And even the most subtle of losses can trigger a sense of grief. So what does that look like and how can we grow through these experiences? Our insight today is through our guest expert, Dr. Dorothy Eleanor Badry. She's a professor in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary and she's worked for 16 years in the child welfare system in Alberta, a longtime advocate, researcher and educator on the impact of FASD or fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Her work also focuses on child welfare issues, disability, women's health, housing and homelessness and the issues of loss and grief. And her most recent research grant is focused on FASD and suicide prevention in Alberta. Dr. Badry has worked closely with the CASA Family Advisory Council as the lead researcher on the recently released Am I Enough Photo Voice Project, which focuses on the concerns of child mental health and its impact on the family. She is the co-author and co-editor of four books, has written 12 book chapters and published multiple research reports. Her leadership includes her role as the Child Welfare Research Lead for the Canada FASD Research Network. Dr. Battery is a recipient of the Premier's Award of Excellence in Education. And a huge welcome to you, Dr. Badry. I'm so glad you're here with us. Um, we're going to start, let's start with an overview of loss and grief because the first thing that comes to mind is something that's significant, like the death of a loved one. But it's really, it's much broader than that. Can you give us an idea of what that looks like? Absolutely, Leslie, and thank you for your kind introduction. It's very good to be here with all of you today. Um, you know, loss is something that we experience on a daily basis. It is a part of our life even when we don't recognize it. So we can have daily losses. We can have losses kind of over periods of time, like during a week, during a month, during a year, or over a lifetime. So loss is with us from basically the beginning of life to the end of life. But there are experiences in life that become very challenging. And I mean, the one that's obvious right in front of us is the pandemic uh, that has really created a lot of loss and grief for people. Uh, but what's important to know is that, you know, loss comes with a variety of emotions and feelings. And when, for example, we experience the death of a loved one, our, our sense of loss is profound. We miss the person. We yearn for that person, we crave for the presence of that person, and we really feel that something has often been taken away from us. And so these are similar experiences for parents of children with mental health issues. Um, they are constantly caring for their children. They are dealing with uh, issues like getting mental health supports, they're dealing with diagnostic, diagnostic clinics, they're dealing with assessments, referrals, and 
really trying to find a way to provide the kind of supports their children need to effectively live their lives with support and within the community. So those are losses that happen generally, but during a pandemic, they're really multiplied. I mean, you think about, for example, um, you know, let's look at the loss of a loved one, the death of a loved one. Um, you know, there really isn't that, there aren't the same opportunities to, to grieve in something like that, that there are when we don't have a pandemic. No, the losses associated with the COVID-19 pandemic have been absolutely profound across every sector of society. And, you know, often we have events that might impact one sector of the population. But in this case, in the, in the case of the pandemic, the entire society has been affected from young children to, uh, to adolescents, to teenagers, to young adults, to adults, to seniors. Every sector of the population is being affected, both men, women, uh, children, and there is nobody that is left unaffected, including the professional people providing support on the front line, and all of those people that are, are working so hard to try to manage this pandemic and having some limited success in some, in some places. And there has been a lot of deaths and a lot of illness and a lot of unexpected ways that people have had been forced to deal with their own loss and their grief. The typical rituals for people are not existing in the way that we are formerly used to them happening. And I heard a journalist interviewing somebody yesterday and uh, about the pandemic and one of the, the individuals said the hardest thing for, for him was not being able to go to funerals, that he lost friends and he wasn't able to go to funerals. And I've known people myself during this time who've lost people who have been unable to go to funerals. Uh, I've had students who have lost their grandparents, uh, who have had parents who have suffered illnesses, who aren't able to travel to be with them due to the lockdown and restrictions. So these are some of the other losses that are not just, you know, around death, but the daily losses. We've had students who've had to adapt to online learning versus being able to be in relationship with their peers at, in school. We've had young people lose their school placements uh, because, at, that have had to be home because of the pandemic. And in fact, that has created a number of issues for parents uh, who themselves have experienced losses of their, their daily routine, their jobs, their, uh, their routine, uh, the structure that they had in their lives. For many people, their paycheck. Uh, for many people, they've had to apply for some of the available income support programs. And so these losses keep mounting for families and communities. What's the connection between loss and grief? The connection between loss and grief is that a loss is the precipitating event. So loss comes first and grief follows. And something as simple as the dictionary gives us a definition of, of grief, which states keen mental suffering or distress over affliction or loss, sharp sorrow, painful regret, a cause or occasion of keen distress or sorrow. And if we take, that's from dictionary.com, by the way, and it's it's a fallback for me. I always look something up at the, in the dictionary just to just to find what everybody else thinks. And another aspect of loss followed by grief is that of bereavement. And bereavement is identified as a deep and poignant distress caused by or as if by bereavement, a cause of such suffering, a trouble, a lot of grief. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, in particular, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a cause of much suffering, has been a cause of much loss, much grief, much bereavement. But, you know, while that is an important aspect, getting back to our focus on parents and children with mental health issues, these are things that parents and children are 
experiencing on a daily basis and have experienced throughout the lives of caring for their children. Oh, and, sorry. sorry. I thought you were finished. Okay. Um, also experiencing them in isolation. Uh, yeah. And if I, if I can, bef to sort of get into that, I'd like to uh, read something that actually you uh, brought to our attention, something that uh, uh, we did the interview with uh, Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate uh, the last time. And uh, you talked about something that, a quote of his, that you love to put uh, to students. Uh, and I'm just going to read it briefly. Uh, we have never been so alone together, not so together while being vulnerable alone vulnerably alone. The novel coronavirus has already wrought the conditions for extraordinary collective trauma. The experience of genuine grief protects from trauma. We're all losing something. A sense of security, no matter how precarious, holds us in a world that appears familiar and in which we feel we know how to be a sense of ourselves. Why is that quote significant? You know, I'm a great fan of Dr. Gabor Mate and his work. And as a social worker, I've been particularly drawn to his work and have heard him speak before. And when I heard this, when I read this quote, actually, it it drew me in um, because that, that notion of being so alone together, you know, we, here we are recording on New Year's Day because we have nowhere else to be except alone in our homes, um, and we're making the best of the situation, right? And, you know, you have to have a sense of, of um, I guess, humor, of resiliency, and so you make the best of things, right? But I, I think this quote just resonates with me because, you know, the, the important notion that genuine grief protects from trauma is really, a catalyst here for allowing people to experience grief for saying it's okay to experience your grief it's okay to let it out it's okay to be upset about it it's okay to be anxious about it it's okay because we are all experiencing this as a community there is nobody who is not experiencing this and some people are coping with it better than others in terms of mental health and distress and anxiety. Now at the U of C you also teach a course. Uh, you've been teaching it many for many many years now on loss and grief. What's the core of that course? What do you want students to walk away with? You know it's really interesting. We you know getting back to your earlier question about you know loss and grief is not just something that is uh, related to death but is something that we experience uh, throughout life. Um, for example, I worked in child welfare and, you know, part of child protection at times is removing children uh, from their parents. But most of the time it's about providing support and strategies to parents so that they can, they can parent their children. But we want people that work as helpers to understand that they, while they need to be compassionate, they also need to engage in self-care, that they need to have a good understanding of loss and grief theory, and that these experiences are really unfold during the life course. And one of our topics is grief in childhood and adolescence, and the need, and then looking at it in young and middle adulthood. And we particularly look at grief in older adulthood because we recognize there's so many issues that are unfolding for seniors and again tying back to the pandemic it has been seniors and those in long-term care who have been the most vulnerable in the pandemic so there there are special issues and concerns around loss and grief for seniors that we really need to pay attention to and in fact they are amongst our most vulnerable members of society so i believe that we have a really important responsibility to provide the care and support that our elders need in order to live their lives as fully as possible. And it's been very sad to see what's unfolded for seniors during the pandemic. None of us are untouched. We've seen, we've all seen the images of the families uh, through the glass windows, looking at their relatives, trying to connect with their parents 
I myself am responsible for an 89 year old uh, who is in one of the care facilities that had a very small outbreak. And so there was a period of time where there was a lockdown and I wasn't able to visit. And I was able to go back and visit uh, last week. There was a slight outbreak. So you have to go through a number of precautions, a number of steps. Um, and so there are, there's a need to recognize that um, we need to safeguard our vulnerable citizens and our vulnerable people. We really need to um, be the first line of defense for those who are vulnerable. We need to be able to care for them. We need to be able to make sure that they, they are safe and secure and that all of their needs are met. And, and sadly, during the pandemic, we've seen a lot of the vulnerabilities unfold in the care system that have been very difficult to watch for everybody. Um, this is something that really touches you personally. Um, you have basically spent your life uh, uh, passionate about, dedicated to helping people in vulnerable uh, groups. Um, where does that come from? What, what's, uh, what's that background that, that makes you passionate about this topic? You know, I um, I grew up in a neighborhood where there was a large community, and that was a community of people with disabilities living in the community, uh, many who had really just left institutional care in the 70s. And so it was really an interesting experience. And my first job was in the disability field um, for three years, working with adults with developmental disabilities. And then and my father was a firefighter, um, a kind of the helping tradition. My sister became a nurse. She worked in emergency at one of the hospitals in Calgary. My brother works in the, in the human services field with, with the government and is a manager in, in, in a helping, key helping role. And I'm a social worker. So we used to say in the family that we've got all areas covered if anybody needs any help. But you know, in 1988, I became the mother of a child with a disability. Uh, her name is Krista, and she is now 32, and she has a metabolic disease as well as developmental disabilities. So she is counted amongst the very vulnerable in terms of the pandemic. Um, she's a tiny person. She hasn't grown much since age 12, really. So she's, I'm, I'm short, but she's shorter than me. Um, she has a wicked sense of humor. Um, she goes to a day program, but hasn't been able to access that for many months. They had a short window where they returned. And then, of course, things reared up with the pandemic. And there was a lot of restrictions around um, her placement with her supportive roommate for, for all of the families, really. So I had much more limited contact with my daughter than I was used to having. And I finally was able to have her over for, for Christmas, um, being on my own. I also uh, live with my 83-year-old mother, who's a very private person, but um, she uh, she's very worried about the pandemic as well, as, as anybody is, right? And she had some significant health issues the last couple of years. So it's really been, it's a challenge. I feel, you know, a bit of a, bit of a sandwich there between, you know, my child, my mother, my other responsibilities, but you know, it's, it's all okay. And I feel that um, everybody that I know has pretty much um, has stayed healthy. I've had a couple of students who have been affected. I've known some people whose family members have been affected and had COVID-19, my own niece and her husband had COVID-19. Uh, and, and recovered from that. So it's been a really, it's, it's a roller coaster. And, you know, I've watched my students really um, suffer through the pandemic in terms of, you know, being young adults whose whole lives are geared towards socialization, towards being part of the community. I mean, we're not accustomed to being stay at home people. That is not our life. We are accustomed to going out, to being in the community, to connecting with people. That's what we're about. And uh, that is not happening right now. And that's especially hard, as you mentioned, on students and young people. Um, 
Uh, this is a time when, you know, that socialization is just so important to them. You said that you did a significant uh, research project with your students uh, at the beginning when you taught the course on, on uh, loss and grief, and some really profound insights came out of that about what they go through. Can you share a bit of that with us? Yes, um, I, I'm actually just uh, formulating the research project, but what it is, is with the, we have a program called the, at the Faculty of Social Work at University of Calgary called the Foundation Program. So we have students who don't have a background in social work, but have other degrees. And these, they're an amazing group of students as are all of our students, but these students in particular bring another lens to social work that is really powerful. And I created in August, um, for the course outline on human called human behavior in the environment a 50 percent major assignment on the COVID-19 pandemic and it was really important for me and in consultation with our associate dean academic it was really important for me to find a way for uh, people new to the social work field to grapple and try to come to an understanding of some of those issues that they were going to face not only as social workers, but as human beings living through this pandemic. So a number of questions were asked of the students in relation to, um, you know, what are some of the ways in which uh, the, the pandemic has unfolded? How has this exper experience affected marginalized populations and individuals? Uh, what are some of the ways that um, they can work um, from a personal, uh, professional and political lens, um, how are they engaged in self-care, and and what are some of the key theories that would support students in understanding that. And, you know, it was a it was a bit of a challenge, and a key resource actually was the book out of Queen's University called Vulnerable, which uh, Dr. Jane Philpott was being interviewed one morning on CBC about, and immediately I heard that interview, and use that as a resource uh, for the students and embedded it into the course. But the, the need to look at the pandemic as a social work educator for social work students who are going out to help people was really critical. And so it was a bit of a bit of a risk to and a big ask of students. But you know what, they stood up to the challenge. They presented incredible papers there was a number of themes that emerged and, you know, not only is, has some, um, the pandemic affected basically the mental health of, of young people and, and students and, you know, not, not everybody's that young. We have a range of age for students, but you know, that it really has affected their livelihoods. It's affected their well being. Um, it's been very stressful. It's been hard to, to manage the new lifestyle that has been required of people. And so the social isolation has really had a deep impact. But what I also saw in our weekly get together was people building community, people building bridges with each other. I saw resiliency. I saw students who um, have gone through really hard times uh still do their work somehow find some core strength and some resiliency to to meet the requirements of the course and not only to meet the requirements but to excel this was an, a, a remarkable group of students and and they said i know a lot of people they said thank you for bringing all your great friends in to you know give us some lessons as well i had an artist um an indigenous artist come in and do and their final project was arts based and uh, that was a choice of course but so many uh, students did incredible arts based projects that that is going to be a research project so it's been a it's been a remarkable journey with this remarkable group of 32 students you've also had a pretty remarkable journey with CASA because you've done a lot of work with a family council and uh, and that photo, can you tell, first of all, uh, I'm going to show a clip uh, sort of giving a little bit of insight into what parents with, uh, with children with mental disabilities go through, which is what uh, this, uh, this project is designed to do. I live in an 1,100 square foot, three bedroom apartment. There are locks for safety everywhere. 
Am I enough to protect my child? People see me as the strong, capable advocate fighting to find the help my children need. On the inside, I sometimes feel lost and overwhelmed. So Dorothy, that's just one example of of what these parents go through. Can you tell us a bit about this project uh, and, um, and, you know, what it's designed to do? Absolutely. The Family Advisory Council of CASA is a remarkable group of individuals who parent children um, a range of ages, really from very young to young adults. And um, and many have uh, been in the role of either a biological mother or father, um, adoptive or foster care and a guardian in some cases. And these parents have opened my eyes to the world of child and adolescent mental health in new ways, because what we ask the parents to do is to document what their life looked like on a daily basis through the lens of a camera. And it was, it was, you know, a call in August of 2018 that I got um, about what I work with the family advisory council to do a photo voice project. And I said, sure. So, Many months later, we got ethics in place through the University of Calgary. Uh, we did training with the Family Advisory Council in March of 2020, right after we got ethics approval, very early March, and then the pandemic hit. So I was very fortunate to have met the members of the Family Advisory Council. I talked with them on the phone a few times, but I actually got, you know, got to meet with them in early March, and then we've done everything virtually since. But um, the Family Advisory Council came up with the question about the research question for the project from a parent lens, am I enough? I was completely amazed at that question because, you know, as a, I'm, as, a, as Krista's mom, I've often asked myself, am I enough? I especially asked myself after five days of having Krista home over Christmas, am I enough? I was really tired. I'm not a young mom anymore, right? And as parents, we get older. And that was also the experience for some of the parents in the CASA Family Advisory Council group that, you know, they're some, some are younger parents, some are getting older, some are, you know, caring for children um, over the long term with significant mental health issues. And what does that look like in terms of safeguarding those children and protecting them um, in terms of mental health issues in relation to uh, stigma, in relation to experiences of, of oppression? And, you know, it's very hard to parent children with both mental health issues and disabilities. And that's the case for many of these these kids, not only do they have disabilities, but they also have mental health issues. And the other thing that happened um, during this period of time was a number of the gains that were made with some of these children were lost because all of their supports were removed with the shutdown. And so that was made it very difficult for parents to, to cope, to manage uh, kind of day-to-day -day living because the routine and structure that everybody was used to was completely turned upside down. Well, part of the challenge with mental health has been trying to get it on the public radar. Uh, and certainly the pandemic has helped to change that. But this is one of the most vulnerable groups. The Family Advisory Council, we should let people know, uh, is a group of parents whose children uh, or grandchildren in some cases have gone through the programs at CASA. And, um, and I think about five years ago, six years ago, uh, uh, they formed this Family Advisory Council so that they could come together as a group, advise CASA on how to make their programs better, on what was needed, to give a perspective from the uh, parents' point of view. Um, and, um, and I'm very grateful to them because I have learned so much through this group. I have so much admiration for their strength and their drive and their commitment to advocacy. Um, and one of the things in this uh, photo project uh, that really struck me is they talk about faceless, nameless, silenced. And that's the way parents of children with disabilities feel often, is that they are not listened to, their supports get taken away. There's no major uproar about it. Um, 
And yet, uh, you know, the stats, 3.2 million youth in a mental health crisis before COVID. I mean, the problem is significant. And um, what, was, what was your insight? I mean, you've worked with them. You've seen what they go through. What kind of insight have you gained into uh, some of the challenges they have and what they can do? You know, going back to that quote about the faceless, nameless um, child, you know, there's a lot of truth uh, to that because, you know, they they often get silenced within within institutions such as education, you know, within communities, uh, you know, and with, within systems. And unfortunately, um, because of the pandemic, the systems had to go silent, right? They had to literally stop the services that they were providing or find alternate ways to do it, but it was definitely not the same. So, you know, the what I gained from those parents was to recognize uh, not only the depth of struggle that they faced on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, we, we had one mom who experienced a physical injury. Um, a child was extremely frustrated and lashed out at mom who had a significant black eye. And I mean, this was all documented as part of the, the photo voice video, right? So I'm not sharing anything that's confidential. It falls within the realm of our reporting. We had one mom who had young children who said how hard it was to try to keep masks on, to go out in the community, to keep them safe. Um, even for my daughter, I had to buy the child size masks because Krista is so small because the other masks were falling off of her. And so, you know, when we look at uh, the parents, I think what we see is a group of parents who are deeply committed to ensuring the needs of their children are being met in systems that aren't always available. Um, and it's been particularly challenging during this time. But I've also seen, um, I've seen a lot of sense of loss and grief actually you know, as we met weekly um, for approximately two months um, on a weekly basis, actually every Friday night, because still nobody had anywhere to go, um, we got to know each other really well. And the, the impact of mental health of their children on the parents is significant. So these are parents who are often worn out tired, they love their kids, their love is endless for their children, but their their energy is not endless for the children. So a lot of ex children experience dysregulation and parents are left kind of picking up the pieces of all of these changes that have occurred. And, you know, when you think about it, the children thrive with structure, routine and stability with mental health issues. And when that is removed and parents having to teach their children uh, was another burden, that was also really difficult because parents are just trying to cope with day-to-day -day life. So, so some of what um, was asked of parents during the pandemic was possible and some wasn't because it was a matter of day-to-day -day survival and just, you know, coping, getting through a day and I know what that's like and it's it's not easy because you know really you have excessive demands on parents and very few resources to meet those needs so it's 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 a bit of a vicious circle. I want to talk a bit about uh, loss and grief the specifics because when you have a child with a disability um, that's in many ways a loss uh, when you consider what their potential future could be so there's a loss of maybe a, a bigger picture of what that future could look like. But there are a lot of different types of losses and, um, and then the, uh, the grief that comes with it. Can we go through some of those, some of the big ones and the smaller ones that maybe you wouldn't think of in terms of loss? Sure, the, um, the sense of loss that um, parents experience is really around, one part of it is, especially when you have a child with a disability, and with mental health issues is that you're a forever parent, right? We all expect, you know, the general expectation within society is that you, you raise your children, they grow up, they, they move on, they become, 
you know, uh, they become their own people, not so dependent on mom and dad or just mom or dad or whoever it is. Um, but when you have a child with mental health issues and disabilities, you are a forever parent. And so that is that is one of the losses. Um, but you also have um, a different life course when you have a child with these issues. And so, you know, I, I, I'm part of a kind of a collective of parents who, you know, I know some who have children with significant mental health issues, um, who are older, who are bigger, who are stronger, who some of the behavioral problems are very significant. Um, you know, the parents aren't physically strong enough to handle the behavior of the of the young person, young adult. So they need lots of support in the home and they have to really do a lot of work, write a lot of creative proposals, do a lot of asking for support that most parents wouldn't have to ask for, but recognizing that if they don't ask for support, that things are going to get worse. So there's a lot of advocating that parents have to do for their children with disabilities that most parents don't have to do. And that is a lot of work. And, you know, you have to become a guardian, you have to become a trustee, like you have to do all of these things on behalf of your child so that you can take care of them properly. So there's a lot of added responsibilities. Then you have to, you know, try to help them be as successful as possible within whatever school or program they're in. Um, you know, you need to figure out what's going to happen when they transition from children's services to adult services, from family support for children with disabilities to the persons with developmental disabilities system. Like there are so many transitions and so many responsibilities that come with those transitions. And then as a parent, you have to keep your head above water. Many parents are single, many parents are working. Um, so many parents were deeply affected with the pandemic because they had the responsibility of their children, whether they be young children, whether they be adolescents, whether they be adults with disabilities um, in their care situation at home for many, and really having to do a lot of extra work to manage that. And those have come with a significant price. Those are big issues in terms of loss and grief because 24 hour parenting is not healthy for anybody either. either. Well, it's been interesting. There haven't been a lot of stats that have come out uh, about this pandemic yet, um, but um, uh, it's incredible how this pandemic has hit particularly vulnerable groups, but also what would be considered non-vulnerable groups. So parents of, of uh, young children uh, and uh, how the, you know, the stress uh, that's being reported is so high, but even for average Canadians. Um, there was a, a Canadian mental health survey that came out in September. Um, it said that 40% of the people surveyed said that their mental health had deteriorated since COVID began. And that was from back in mid-September, and now we're in the second wave of this pandemic. So it's really had a significant impact, and we won't know for some time about what that impact is. No, we won't. And in fact, I think, you know, there's, I heard some information on the radio the other day that those numbers just keep increasing, that, you know, in fact, you know, again, the, you know, it's not just one sector of the society that's affected. It is every population, like um, ch young children who have been, you know, denied seeing their friends, their, their family, how much they miss them, how much they don't understand what's happening um, and how much parents are on the hook to try to explain all of this to children and often at a loss and just trying to cope um, as best they can. And I saw a little clip on the uh, New Year's, one of the New Year's Eve shows yesterday and one mom was, maybe it was a bit of a spoof, but she was calling for help and said, I need help, I have two really mean students here. They're both my daughters. And I thought, I thought, good for you for having a sense of humor about it. But, you know, it's a, it's a tough road. And, you know, there's, and, and it will affect, like the implications for child development are very high 
Um, you know, I know parents who have children who are already shy of strangers, already shy of other adults, right? I don't know what that's going to look like after the after the pandemic. And, you know, it's it's just very, it's just a very different experience. And so, you know, this idea of isolating, of protecting oneself, of being away from others, of not being part of the community or at a distance is very, very difficult for people to cope with. And, you know, there's a, going back to Dr. Maté's quote, like we've never been so alone together, no so nor so together while being vulnerably alone is very true and very poignant and very meaningful because, you know, this, there's a lot of people frustrated with hearing things like we're all in this together, but, you know, some people say, well, we're all in this together, but you're there and you're there and, you know, nobody's, nobody's here with me. Right. So, you know, it, it, it contributes to a sense of isolation. And, you know, there's a, there's a model of grief that exists that uh, Dr. Francis Weller created that, um, you know, really tells us we don't know enough about, about loss and grief. It's something we're still learning. We're learning about in new ways. But he has this model of the five gates of grief. So he talks about the first gate as everything we love, we will lose. So the loss of others. And, I, I, and this isn't necessarily related to death, right? The second gate is, you know, the places that have not known love in a person's life. So how were, were, we, were we raised? What was lost in that process? And so, you know, how are children, children being raised right now? What, what are these losses that are occurring right now? Um, the third gate is the sorrows of the world, which we are all very familiar with right now. Um, the troubles of today and yesterday. And, you know, as we still see it, the future is uncertain. We're all excited there's a vaccine for the pandemic, but we're all continue to worry. Uh, the fourth gate is what we expected and did not receive. And so these are all of those things, you know, when we're born and we pass through childhood, we have these expectations and nobody has a perfect childhood. There's many things that are unmet yet people somehow still make it through to adulthood. Um, but you know, what happens, where do those experiences that people are going through uh, right now, the things they expected and haven't received, what does that mean in people's lives? And you know, the other, the fifth gate that Weller identified is ancestral grief. And he talks about the grief that is carried in the body and the community from the sorrows of the ancestors. And, you know, we're really um, at a time where our Indigenous communities have really suffered as well in the pandemic. Um, there's, uh, you know, many of the human rights that are, are, um, are challenged by First Nations are kind of on the back burner during the pandemic. So there's, there's many of those kind of loss and grief issues as well that are important not to lose sight of. I also want to talk about some of the uh, loss and grief things that we don't think of in terms of the traditional thing. Things like, uh, you know, when you have a, a significant change in your life, graduation. Uh, in a pandemic, that means something very different. Uh, uh, you know, maybe for all those people who have lost their jobs and the threat of losing their, their home, um, you know what are what what impact does that have? I mean, what are the what are the physical, emotional, mental uh, impacts um, that those kinds of losses have on a person? You know, when you look at uh, things, you just reminded me to you know think about things from you know kind of the you know the an indigenous lens where the mental, physical spiritual and emotional are all key aspects of, of kind of a life circle. And, you know, I, I've got many Indigenous students and colleagues and allies, and, um, you know, we've, we've talked about what's been happening in people's lives. I have friends in Edmonton who do advocacy for vulnerable children and families and how hard it has been for people to do that kind of work. But when we, you know, they're, some of the agencies, like 
I don't know if I'm allowed to mention an agency, but some of the agencies are providing meals for impoverished families who have no, um, have very limited means of income. This is a program that they weren't providing prior to the pandemic, or they were providing on a much limited scale. We have programs in Calgary that are providing brown bag lunches to children at home that used to get them at school. Like there's so many of those kind of impacts. We also have the experience of, of um, incidents of domestic violence that have increased and that, you know, there's very limited windows for, for in women and children to leave these circumstances sometimes. We've had shelter beds um, not being used because women are afraid to access them because of the pandemic. Um, we've had uh, people experiencing homelessness who are not using shelters because of fear of the pandemic. Um, we just had a significant fire here in Calgary under the bridge, a uh, major bridge on Highway 1 um, uh, linked to individuals living under the bridge and starting a fire for warmth. You know, these are all, you know, these are all tragedies. These are all things that um, might be avoided if we weren't in these circumstances right now. But there's a lot of people out there that are volunteering. There are young people who have risen to the challenge to provide supports. There's been many, many um, food drives. There's been many clothing drives. There's been, you know, many kind of um, uh, community initiatives. There's been people reaching out to seniors, people getting their groceries, you know, people doing many, many good things to provide support to others as well. But, you know, those who have experienced financial distress, that has been one of the biggest hardships because that deeply contributes to them to mental health issues and creates a lot of problems for families. And there's a lot of families have suffered with the, um, with the loss of income and um, aren't able to meet their financial obligations. So that's been a real, really major struggle. I want to talk about resiliency, Dorothy, because um, one of the reasons why human beings have done as well as they have is because we are resilient as a species and we learn to adapt. Um, and what have you seen, especially with vulnerable groups, has helped to contribute to uh, resiliency that might be able to help others through theirs or find theirs? You know, it was really neat with my daughter's day program, what they did was they did some online Zoom sessions. Um, they did music at one point and, you know, it was really great. I've been able to do FaceTime with my daughter, which has been really important. And I've seen a lot of that occurring um, between seniors and their families. Uh, but, you know, resiliency is one of those characteristics that somehow you're able to kind of look through this this valley that kind of looks, you know, kind of sloping and dark and just lift your head a little higher and see the light on the other side as one of my uh, famous singer friends uh, would, would say in one of her songs, you know, just see the light on the other side. That's not easy to do, but the re resiliency is about digging deep. It's about going within it's about finding something within oneself that gives you a reason to go beyond your current circumstances and i'm a big fan of of um everybody identifying their own what i would call a resiliency narrative you know what are you doing and recognize what you're doing that helps you to cope with the challenges that you face on a daily basis that helps you to manage with your family with whatever's going on in your circumstances. So resiliency is about that drive to stand up and just take the next step sometimes. It doesn't have to be anything major. It just has to be about getting up and taking that step forward and not necessarily taking that step backward. So it's just to take that one step at a time, one day at a time, and just to keep moving in a direction that brings you forward to wherever it is you need to go. So and that's different for everybody. Different for everyone, and, and I'm sure for some people listening to this or watching this that they might be thinking, yes, but my problems are so huge, I don't even know where to begin with that first step. So where can people go for help? How can people find help 
um, to, to at least begin that process of helping them to get through this? You know, there's a lot of local resources, in, uh, well, at least looking at the province of Alberta, but the, you know, certainly the Canadian Association for Mental Health, the Alberta Health Services, Mental Health Services. Um, what I've noted is that services that are reaching out to people have been very responsive. responsive. The, we see a lot, I've seen a lot of ads myself for some of the counseling agencies, and there's been a lot more um, social media promotion. If you need mental health support, please call these numbers. And, you know, people have talked about, you know, this kind of shadow pandemic of mental health. Um, you know, it was one of our moms when we started the Photo Voice Project who said, you know, Canada has a pandemic, but we have a mental health pandemic with our children. You know, going back to that photo voice and going back to CASA and doing that work. And when this parent said that, it profoundly struck me that we do have a mental health pandemic that, you know, was going on long before COVID-19 that will, you know, has been shifted and exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, but it continues to be the experience of many Canadians and will continue to be the experience of many Canadians. And so there are multiple resources in place in terms of locally, uh, provincially, nationally, that can be accessed. Dorothy, any final words? Well, I'd just like to say thank you, Leslie, to you, to your crew, um, and especially to CASA for caring enough to try to address these very difficult and complex issues. I'd especially like to thank the Family Advisory Council for, first of all, for getting to meet them, for getting to know them, for working with them, um, and for continuing to be connected to them. They did amazing work with the Photo Voice Project, and that work is a legacy for CASA, and is a legacy that will continue and is available for people to use. So, so thank you to everybody. So I want to thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Badry. That was so insightful. Dr. Badry is also a guest on Global News Morning Edition in Edmonton for the regular monthly feature, CASA Presents Your Mental Health. And you can watch a recording of her interview at globalnews.ca. We'd also really appreciate it if you would share your thoughts about this session by taking our survey. Just click on the link in the description below because your feedback is really important to us because we want to keep these sessions relevant and informative and enjoyable. And finally, I mentioned earlier that CASA is a nonprofit organization and your support of their work with infants, children, youth and their families is so appreciated. Um, if you can, we'd love it if you could donate. Please go to our website at casaservices.org and click on the donate button. On behalf of CASA, Child, Adolescent and Family Mental Health, Thank you for joining us. I'm Lisa McDonald. We'll see you again next month. And in the meantime, be well and be kind.